Hello, the Rebel One, and welcome back to TNO, the Lost News of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokalover, and right now we are currently finishing up with the free world. After gaining the favor of the OFM, we are now firmly cemented as one of the free nations of the world. We have rebuilt our relationship with the former Commonwealth members and reaffirmed our, the old alliance with the U.S. Uncle Sam and Britannia are arm in arm once again, and the light of democracy shall never fail on our island again. Cool, and we'll probably go ahead and do... Uh, England and England rebuild. Of course, we did that one already. So we got to do all this side, and we got to do a lot of this. But pushing for international recognition, the displacement of the previous collaborationist government after the English Civil War has left some nations in the fog. Some do not know who we are. Some do not recognize our government, and others are not even aware of any changes at all. We must rectify this and show that our government, or our England, is the new and true England. This will allow us to take a step onto the world stage and open diplomatic and trade channels with friendly nations rather than being forced to continue to deal with the devils of Europe followed up with during the Mediterranean. <clears throat> While we won't find many allies near to us in Europe on the Atlantic side, there are more than enough diplomatic prospects in the Mediterranean who may be willing to support our government, specifically the Iberian Peninsula, Balkans, and even Italy. It helps that we share a common inspector, so to speak. We should conduct an official tour of these nations, with the goal of establishing connections as well as improving our own legitimacy after all. If a nation is not recognized as legitimate, is it really a nation? Oh, look at this. Oh, well, never mind. We're doing well. If you wonder about this, please go right ahead. Um, yeah, this one's... Uh, yeah. I think I've read this one all the time. A lot, but... I could be wrong about that, but gosh dang it. We just started this one. Eight days. Ah, we're also formed by new well-meaning well nationalists. Yeah, so it's time to come home. Ah, uh, the dragon of the west, with the chaotic state of Europe and the world, a divided Isles is a doomed Isles. Wales, with its rich coal and coastal resources, will be invaluable to asserting on national strength. We should also not forget our nearly 1,000-year-long history of unity with Wales. The independence is a minor aberration to be corrected with force, if necessary. In the meantime, our diplomatic channels will be buzzing with anticipation of a peaceful union. Irish Free State, look at that. Seamus told me, huh? Okay. There will be blood. Always nice. Um, really? I think I'm gonna cut these guys down into half. We just don't have enough equipment to fill out everything we want here, so I'm gonna cut you guys down. Let's go with the six. Let's see. Will we actually be able to refill the um stockpiles, reserves of equipment to the Welsh issue? George Jellicoe has deemed England able to expand. Wales will soon become its likely target. The nation has been a mess from the start and will likely have no other option than to join us after all. They are fully aware of the measures we will be willing to use if they were to dare defy us. They would have to be led by some sort of madman to de decline. The time for unification talks with the Welsh are upon us. A letter will be sent to Cardiff immediately to get the process started. What choice do they have? Now we have more than enough guns. Actually, that was pretty good for everything else except for uh, anti-air. The delegations meet. The de English delegations arrived in Cardiff soon after they had become a sec were accepted. The keenness of the English to reassert their control over Wales was obvious, however. There's nothing that could prevent them now. No time was wasted in taking pictures of the two sides together for the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers. All the images would show everyone present beaming and ready to get on with the business of unification. Yet George Jellicoe was slightly surprised as Cash the Welsh Prime Minister, looking so dejected once they had moved on from the flash of the press. Perhaps things were not exactly as the English would have liked, but they thought it best to get on with the job at hand, and best not to let the mind linger on such things. They just need a little bit of convincing, we'll say. A little bit of convincing. We're very, very good here. The Welsh demilitarize. <clears throat> The Welsh were quick in sending their reply back to the English. They had unsurprisingly accepted the demand of the demilitarization and assured the English that they had already begun disarming their soldiers. Wow. Wales was now vulnerable to the Wales of the English. There is nothing left to protect it, and the Welsh people have all but surrendered themselves to the English as a result. But what did a choice but what choice did the government have? All things considered, it would be better for them to disarm peacefully now than suffer the harmful consequences of defiance in the future. A dragon without its flame. And they're led by Emrys Thomas, which well, they chose their fate. Uh, the rejector demands. Wales has sent its response and to the immediate immense surprise of the English negotiators. The demands have been rejected. Nevertheless, England will press forward, and the time for talking may be over, but reunification will not be postponed. Those in power in England still believe they, they have been left with no other option than to declare war. The English army was positioned along the border for a reason. War will take over, where peace could have reigned. Neither side sees themselves as responsible for what will come next, though both will inevitably suffer. Uh, we still have no fuel because we're probably building up a lot here. We can afford a little bit more fuel, actually, at this point, because that's fine. We actually don't make any fuel. God dang it. There you go. We have one day of fuel for England. And we immediately go to war. Uh, what is the plane situation like here? Do we have any planes? No. Okay. Well, then. Get a few jet fighters, maybe? Just in case. And do we have any casts? 
Uh, uh, spot a cast. Cool. Uh, you guys go right there. That's fine. Give them a few days to get really deployed, so. And there they go. 94, 56. That looks pretty good for England. Let's go. Oh, whales. Yeah. Goodbye, whales. Well, we, they lost. Um, honestly, I'm going to cut you guys down even further. Because there's not going to be a lot of supply through here. Actually, that's a pretty good supply. That's actually a very good supply, huh? We'll see. I might keep cutting them down. Just to make sure that each division we actually use is very strong. So. Cool. And. Why mob Barrel Guns Pride? The insane dude, Julian K.O. Evans, has been running our western neighbor for over a year now. In his youthful bouts of insanity, he truly believes little whales can stand against the inevitable tides of unification. Down with him. We shall immediately begin preparations for an invasion. We shall crush any insolent pests skirting through the countryside. And within days, our armored corps will be in Cardiff to be greeted as liberators. Kayo has no doubt. Built a vicious and fanatical following, but they are hardly indicative of the average Welshman. A United Britain is closer than ever. Welcome home. The fraud road to reunification is over. Wales, standing for just two decades as an independent, well, perhaps power isn't the right word, that existed for certain. But no longer. Now, as before the war, the great peoples of Wales and England are one. No more scheming nationalists and communists. No more volatile shocks from global coal prices. No everywhere from Cardiff to the distant northern hills near Snowdonia shall be under London's benevolent dominion. Effects of unification? Uh, if you worry about this, please go right ahead. This happens every single time. It is what it is, so I'm not going to touch that. Oh, boy. But on the terrorism, on terror and black shirts. Decades of isolation have deployed or developed curious and dangerous pathologies among many Welshmen, more so than we had first anticipated. Our garrisons of the countryside have faced dozens of bombings and sniper attacks, and we're almost certain that more than one group is at play. To pacify our foes, we need to use both the sword and the pen for those who viciously attack our soldiers. There will be, of course, no mercy unless they surrender. We must specifically track and kill the masterminds, fighting their identities no matter the cost, all the while. Our crack teams of journalists will be ensuring that our campaigns against the enemy will appear to as benevolent as possible soon. There will be nobody left to even fathom Welsh resistance. And two brothers united. At last, Wales has claimed to be or calm to governable levels. Few gunshots ring out, even in the most sparsely populated regions, as citizens slowly resume their normal routines. This process was no easy feat, yet here we stand over a stable union of nations at last. This brief divorce ends all the while Wales' coasts and coal reserves open to our shared use. Soon, none shall travel with Britain. As they're still doing our land auction. But it is what it is. 1.65 billion, not bad, not bad. In the meantime, we're still building up some civvies, but now since Wales is here... Oh, yes, please. Cut. Boost and spend. Cut, cut, cut. Two brothers are reunited. We get some more stability, even though we don't need it. We do have a cup of coffee here and a couple of comments. Someone recommends I play a Thousand Week Reich more, which is true. I should probably play a mod. And specifically play more Serbia. Yep, I hear you loud and clear. At this point, actually, let's cut down on this, too. Uh, America. We'll still keep getting some more fuel, but I don't want to cut that down a little bit more, slightly more, so... And two brothers reunited, and time to push for international recognition once again. Once again, why not? And we have 500, almost 600 political power, which is really nice. Down here, uh, where is this? Yeah, I want the jobs one. 16. Eh, that's kind of okay. Actually, that's not bad to do. Since we do get the other acts, we could probably do in the second half after we do elections and stuff. So, where are we at for this? 90%, 95. I mean, 95, 95, that's really good. And I don't want to touch that yet, just because we will have options to do this up over here as well. So, that would be good. Touring the Medi Medi Mediterranean. Ties with the old fan. While making friends and allies of nations in our immediate vicinity is all well and good. <clears throat> Our greatest allies since that time immemorial here are in the LFM. The U.S. has been a big help, but we also need to reconnect with our old Commonwealth allies, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the like. Since the collaboration of government took power, the cooperation between our nations has been non-existent. It is time to change that. We should conduct official tours of the islands, or the lands, of our old friends. We'll need their help if we hope to become more than a thorn in the devil's side. We get the event hamburgers and hot dogs in New York City. Ah, I've got to pop my back, and let's see. Good. Good, good, good. To the sphere, the East Asia Co Prosperity Sphere, or simply the Sphere, is one of the most foremost military and political alliances. The Japanese Center Pact may find it difficult to trust a nation who was once allied to the Germans and is now courting the U.S., so it is necessary that English 
uh, that England first established cordial relations with the Japanese. We can send a few dignitaries and have the Prime Minister make a visit to Tokyo to make the proper, appropriate gestures. If you want to put that, please go ahead. I'm going to vote for it. Yes. However, if relations are established with the Japanese, the United States and the rest of the OFM will likely be angered. Tensions still run high between the two alliances, and if England is to find a friend amongst them, it must toe this line very carefully. Nice. Better guns. Good, good, good. Sterling SLRs, huh? Nice. Very good. And this path is actually really, really fast. Discuss embassies upon embassies. This guy's not too bad either. Pretty good. Hamburgers and hot dogs in New York City. This was good, thought St. John Stevens, as he slurped down his milkshake. You could get these things everywhere in New York City. An, an entire meal of a sandwich, fries, and a shake in only a few minutes. And for such a low price. There ought to be a location like this in London soon, he thought. Perhaps in every town in... Mr. Stevens, as a Caribbean diplomat, you seem to have drifted off a bit there. Is the OFN still well liked in London? <clears throat> Certainly, Stevens said, remembering that he was in, in an informal lunch during a conference with OFN members. The government is very keen on the OFN. It's really a matter of you all being keen on us. Well, see what Her Majesty thinks about this, chuckled the Canadian Minister of Foreign Affairs. Do you suppose we could put some of our forces in your country? We could run anti-sub patrols to keep the Nazis bottled up in the North Sea. I'm sure Jellicoe would accept that. I'd, I would have to see, but I think we could base some OFN units in England. Possibly include missiles, asked the eager Secretary of State. And there are certain economic obligations the U.S. would like to discuss that come up with membership. Steve has looked at his burger again. Maybe it wasn't exactly the best in quality after all, now that he thought about it. But it's better than starving. Oh, OFN influence will increase by a massive amount. Does that affect us? Um, Wall Street terrorism. Oh. They'll be pacified. That's nice. Oh, we actually did get another option stuff. I didn't realize that. Um, no. You know what? That's weird. OFN membership? It should affect everyone, not just the U.S. I mean, I know the U.S. is leading it. It should be affected the most, maybe. But it'd be like... I don't know. Maybe everyone should get the, the modifier, but... Whatever. Embassies upon embassies. Now that the Civil War is over, it is time to bring England back onto the world stage. From South Africa to Scandinavia, we'll open an embassy in whatever nation will allow us. Some may be less than pleased with their prior affiliations, but opening relations is the first step for reconciliation. In addition, having good relations with the rest of the world will be a crucial step in getting England back on its feet. Sushi and steak in Tokyo. They were talking again. St. John Stevens hated that, mostly because he couldn't understand what the Prime Minister of Japan and the Foreign Minister were saying. He tried to assure himself that things were going to be fine. He had to allow all the social cues, bow instead of shaking hands, taking his shoes off when required, even eating those fried balls. W what were in those balls? Yeah, if you have to question what are in those balls, you might not want, want, might not want to eat them. Mr. Stavos, said the foreign minister through his translator, why does your government wish to reestablish ties with the Japanese Empire after so long? Uh, England is opening up a new chapter in our history. Hmm. Steve has explained, and his translator followed. We wish to seek an independent foreign policy. Uh, whoops, my bad. Ooh, uh, uh, independent policy from Germany, and that means working with other nations to counteract the influence of the pact. They were talking again. Steve was trying to eat a bit to take his mind off of it. Finally, the Prime Minister spoke through the translator this time. Foreign Secretary, do you understand our hesitation to grant recognition to a nation close to the OFM? I do, but the relationship is more as a guarantee of safety against Nazi Germany than an act against the sphere, Prime Minister. If you look at our geopolitical situation, you would find that the OFN is the most natural ally to balance against Nazi aggression. <clears throat> more talking, Stevens went back to his food. Why was Japanese food for we so, so weird? Maybe they were tired of it as well. Curio is popular here, he was told, and the Emperor ate an English breakfast every morning, didn't he? Hopefully that was a good sign. Finally, the Prime Minister said, Mr. Stevens, although we cannot commit to a full diplomatic normalization at this moment, we will recognize your government as the rightful one of England. Time to break out the sake. Sake. Sake? Huh. Ah, it's not sake. Sake. Sasaki. Sake. I think. I could be wrong. But the League meets. Now that we've met with all the leaders individually and secured government along the crown, it is time to hold the first official meeting of the National Democratic League. Oh, Copenhagen talks. Disturbing. Uh, all the party leaders shall be given the opportunity to speak to the League regarding its future and the future of England as a whole. It shall be a great occasion for us to display the internal unity of the League to the world. Embassies upon embassies upon embassies. Followed up with the aftermath. Well, that could have gone better. Our internal divisions have been exposed to the world. We will need to work hard in order to mend the divisions between party lines of the League. Only once we have united both the Patriots and the Liberals beneath the banner of the League can we secure a democratic future for the good of England. 1.52, and we're probably done building cities. Almost. And we're building a lot of forts, because we can. I literally ran out of things to build, so there you go. Build some roads first. Yeah, as you can see, uh, we got a lot of land forts. There's literally no specific order except north near Scotland, so... I should go to England someday. There was another comment saying that, um, like, if we can decriminalize homosexuality in this campaign, don't, because I did that as Harold Wilson. That's a comment I thought I'd never get, but you know what? Someone asked for it, and we if that happens, then so be it. 
Don't want to do exactly the same thing every single time. Go, cool. the league meets. They won other NDL conference. <gasps> Gentlemen, ladies, uh, esteemed party members, said Prime Minister Jellicoe, welcome to London, and welcome to the first party conference of the National Democratic League government. Let's set off wild cheers, or wide cheers and applause, and again, if they wouldn't applaud at that, what, what, what would they then applaud? We've much to discuss, starting with the recent victory that our party achieved at the polls. The New England has spoken, and the New England agrees that what the NDL stands for. A strong England, a united England, and an England that moves into the new world without turning its back on its glorious past. No matter what comes across, or obstacles in our way. We must remember this victory, that the first government of England chosen by the people was ours, that our platform was endorsed by the people, and that we must stand in ranks with our party and the people to give them what we want and what we promise them. More applause, the party was receptive to Jellicoe's message of unity, and hopefully they would keep the spirit of cooperative unity through the other speeches that would be held this week. Stevens is up next. Where do we place the Whigs? What do we do the Patriots? We need to do something with more liberal members of the League. They need to be assigned to various positions throughout the government. We could place them favorably in order to garner their support. They will surely appreciate this even if the Patriots do not approve. Alternatively, we could use them to fill out the lower, less influential positions and place our own people up top to consolidate our control. Day to the League. Conference. And coffee. Too often in the previous governments. The poor have been ignored, left without resources they need to adapt, or the skills to improve their position, says St. John Stevens. The collaborators have allowed this crisis to spread, and the war has expanded it enormously. We must address this issue immediately, and NDL government must not leave the poor and destitute behind. Moreover, as a recently liberated country, we have a duty to help the other nations under the yoke of authoritarian oppression. Our victory has encouraged the peoples of the unfree world. We must join with the other democracies to encourage the cause of freedom, to give the oppressed our aid and help in the internal struggle for freedom, and to ensure that the cause of liberalism marches ever onwards. More applause for the Foreign Secretary, but also a few boos and heckles. These were not the SPD, or SPD, no, SDP protesters who had infiltrated the meeting, rather. They were Patriot Party members. They were not happy with the content of the speech, and many other rightward members of the party were sitting on their hands during the speech, despite Jellicoe's words yesterday. Strong divisions still did exist under the surface. Hopefully they like Powell's speech a little bit better. England, nay, Britain, need not to be reminded of its former glory, said Powell, for all it is around us. It is in the grand structures made by our ancestors, the canals dug by them, the monuments built in their honor. Britain has a proud past, one that must be remembered and cherished as it moves forward. Yet it is filled with disasters of the age she finds herself in. Buildings bombed out and unable to house people, widespread poverty and unemployment, the rise of socialistic attitudes and beliefs, all of these threats in our country, and must be satisfactorily addressed to ensure the continuing existence of Britain as a nation, but as just as worrying and as disastrous for our country is the total transformation to which there is no parallel in a thousand years of history. What thousands upon thousands are alarmed at is a rising influx of immigrants and so-called refugees into our cities. We must be mad to per permit thousands of persons to overwhelm our lands and the people who live here. As a woman in my constitu constituency said to me recently, in 10 or 20 years, the Pollocks and Romanians will hold the whip over the white. Shut the F up, yelled a man, and the convention descended into a sea of chaos. Everyone was shouting at the man on the stage, at the people yelling on the man on the stage, and the people yelling at the people yelling at the man on the stage. Nobody could hear anything over the speakers anymore, and the media were firmly focused on the disaster unfolding in the stands. Throughout it all, a shock Jellico could only stare before being quickly escorted out of the building. Why can't the SLP have these problems? Because that wouldn't be as nearly as much, much fun. Hey, if it's not politics and people are not throwing punches and yelling and screaming at each other, is it really politics? Or do you just have an autocratic elite? The effects of unification, if you want to do about that, please go ahead. They're stuck with us now. Great. More stability, war support, damage, garrisons goes down. Good. I'm going to do this side first, and then we'll do this side. Convince the swing voters. There are many voters stuck between us and the social Labour Party. The Whigs have the ability to sway some of these swing voters to our side by promising the same SLP pol policies these voters are enamored with. Through this, the Whigs will benefit us by bringing more votes to our cause and to part of the SLP. If you want to know about the greatest story never told, please go right ahead. But happy 1968, everyone. Hope you're having a tremendous, tremendous new year. And we're done building. Oh, okay. Well, now we're stuck at 1.52. That's not great. But once we get Scotland, it's probably going to shoot up even more. Maybe. This guy's a democracy, a ruffled wig. The wig faction is a bit of a conundrum. On the one hand, their support is needed to keep things running in Parliament, and the positions are often close to the ones Jellica holds in private. On the other hand, they sometimes end up causing friction with the conservative faction of the party, so what do we do with them? We could get them to quiet down by giving them what they want. More ministerial positions would get them to be satisfied with their government, and will therefore allow us to move forward with a more conservative position without too much complaint. Press time will also make St. John Stevens extremely happy, but that may also prove disastrous. Conservative members of our party may be angered that these people are being made the face of the party, and maybe just keeping things where they are for now might be the best course of action. Give them a boost. I'll uh, keep them where they are. I want to keep them where they are just because I do want to keep doing this whole things as well. More jobs. So, 
Like, we're going to boost him up anyways from here on out if we possibly can without running into too many PP issues. And, of course, Wig support will him now right now. And that's why we're going to do the side next. And then we'll do the Uniting the Party last. We'll all have dirty secrets. Oh, recently some information has been brought to our attention regarding a particular topic it concerns St. John Stevis in regards to his unconventional tastes. It would seem his dedication to the decriminalization of homosexuality is due, in no small part to his preferences. Oh, this information could be extremely damaging to both him and the League were it to become public knowledge, especially in the socially conservative climate of the country. We must meet with him at once in order to clear up this issue. And then, what to do with Patriots? The right-wing Patriot Party is in an odd situation. In a rare point of agreement, both the SLP and the Whigs vehemently oppose them, calling them fascists. Regardless, we need them and their influence over the right-wing sections of the population. Just as the Whigs, we must decide where to put them. Whether we place them in higher-up influential positions or in the lower-down, less prestigious positions, something must be done with them. Oh, we got two done. Nice. Let's finish out the land auction here. Actually, well, actually, no. Uh, uh, actually, Let's look at the focus tree for, real quick. Because we'll probably... Oh, yeah, we'll probably do this one as well. Yeah, we get two 50% bonuses. Let's do at least... We'll do one for now. And the other one we'll do later. Let's go do that one. Thank you. That's fine. That is A-OK -okay with us. We all have dirty little secrets, my friends. Where are we at? 42%? Not bad. Oh, that's not good. We definitely want more support here. We have Patriots, Whigs, and Democrats. MSA, huh? Not bad. Not bad. Compromising, a foreign secretary John Stevens looked up from his desk as the Prime Minister Hurley walked in and shut the door behind him. What's the problem, George? he asked. Jellico looked at him and said, There's a problem, Foreign Minister. My friends have heard rumors that threaten to upend your position, that you might be a homosexual. Jellico's eyes grew wide. Stevens chuckled and said, Well, I always wonder how long it would take for your lads to find out, and I assure you, Prime Minister, what you heard is correct. Jellico's a guest. Norman, what the absolute F are you doing? Jesus Christ, the electoral consequences of the. Why are you so calm about this, George? Lots of politicians that have said things that they'd rather keep under wraps. Things that everyone knows but nobody says. If everyone spoke up about a little infractions, it would bring down the bloody government. If, for example, someone knows that I like other men and I, and I know they're boozing it up with ca call girls, we can both live and let live, can't we? Jellicoe's blood went cold and Stevens knew he proved his point. Let's not be... Let's not let... Bleh. Let's not let this become an issue, Prime Minister. Sway the right, though. Many right-wing voters have been refusing to vote following the loss of the collaborationist government. If we are to achieve a strong majority over the SLP, we'll need these voters. By using our good friends in the Patriots, we should be able to sway these voters using the Patriots' right-wing and conservative ideals. Strength of the Patriots increase. The NDLs, oh, and Severn, the support actually goes down. We get more authoritarian democracy. Interesting. Because I do want to go with the Democratic England as fast as possible. Well, I guess that's not really true since I did everything else but this stuff first, but whatever. Cool. Gunnerinos. Awesome. Let time go on. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And wait, 1.46 billion. Not bad. And 1.4%. Oh, it might have been always like that. Russia's just killing itself right now, though. Keep spending. Actually, we could, actually if we get cut, cut for both, that might be really good, but we might need more PP. Issues with patriotism. The Patriot Party is a bit of an issue. They are necessary to get things passed in the Parliament, however. They have a habit of supporting unpopular and unpalatable things that make Jellicoe nervous, so... How do we satisfy them? Oh, Africa's dead. One way is to give them more control over our Minister of Appointments. The more people they can get into positions of power, the more satisfied they'll be, and more exposure in the press will make also help. Everyone loves the limelight, and that just might make them more satisfied with how things are. But do we really want power to be the face of a party? We'll still need the Liberals to pass bills, so maybe it's the best things... It's best things to stay just as they are. Sorry, Africa. But you're gone now. Twenty more. That's that's a little bit too low. Give them, keep them where they're at. No, we're gonna give them a boost. There you go. That really didn't help all that much. Okay then. Um, hmm. Well then. Well, we want the conservatives increased right now. Patriots, fifteen. Speak with them. That's not bad. Anything else? I mean, I do want to increase the strength of the Democrats too. I think that'd be good to do. Anything else? Military loyalty will increase, but we can wait for that one. Stability. We don't need that one. Yeah, let's do that both. There you go. Fourteen sixty nine. Nice. Nice. Oh, what to do with Powell? At the end of the day, it all comes down to a single man, Enoch Powell. We must decide how much media attention we can allow him to have. While giving him more time on air will definitely allow us to reach out to more voters, especially amongst the far right, it is equally possible that this could cause the population to become more conservative and right-wing. Why not? Uh, unfortunately, my friends, I am out of coffee now, so big sadness hours, but that's alright. I just hit my water bottle with my tooth. Oh, it's not chipped. Cool. And unite the party. Or uniting the party. A house divided cannot... 
a house divided against itself cannot stand. It's quite an American saying, but it still holds true. We cannot hope to bring England forward into the world if we are occupied with fight, infighting and factionalism. We must rally both the left and right wing elements of our party and the country as a whole for it to succeed. It shall not be easy, but it must be done for the good of England. Nice, very good. Actually, a little jobs thing. There's still 1.4. Hmm. More jobs? 16. There you go. 68, 16, 16. Yeah, they're balanced. Uh, Powell's unique characteristic. We must be mad, literally mad, as a nation to be permitting the annual inflow of thousands of dependents who are, for the most part, the material of the future growth of the immigrant descended population. In these circumstances, nothing will suffice but that the total inflow for settlement should be reduced at once to neg negligible proportions. <clears throat> Especially when taking into consideration that the alien element in question carries with it the Eastern Orthodox religion, totally abhorrent to the well established institution of Anglican dominance in our country. F in hell, thought Jellicoe as he turned off the TV. You know, Powell was becoming a massive problem. His statements in the press kept causing headaches in the party. The SLP had gone from mildly displeased to furious when the man spoke on immigration. For it could no longer be considered a misstep, it was now clearly a window into the dark and hateful mind. The NDL could not simply comment and turn away from Powell, as it had for so long. <clears throat> or it could undercut him, sideline the Patriots, weaken them, help the Liberals out. That had its own problems with party unity, but surely something had to be done. <clears throat> hmm... Strength of the Wigs decrease. I think we got it. Uh, time to yank it. I'd like to do that one, but we got to do that one just because we got to keep getting more jobs here. Hmm. Cool. And after uniting the party, we'll do a common enemy. If Hitler's meteoric and unprecedented rise of power is as anything, is that a common foe is the best to make enemies into allies. With Hitler, it was the Jewish peoples. With us, it shall be a group that actually possesses a threat to society, the Social Labour Party. By fabricating some stories and rumors roughly based upon real events, we can twist perception of them to suit our purposes and hopefully unite the League. Nice. We'll lose some Libertarian Socialism support, which is totally fine with us. A party united. United. We've now united the League. Whether this unity shall last is a question for another time, for at this very moment, the whole League is working towards a common goal. To finalize this unity, we shall invite the four most important individuals in the League, Alkin like Steve, Sterling, and Powell, to a dinner at number 10 Downing Street. This could only end well, right? Right? 16, 13. Well, Libs, you're going to get more support whenever we can give people more jobs. There you go. 15, 15, 17. Not bad. Works for us. A command, and then a democratic England, probably. Well, I should have that one. Cool. Two more things done. Sucks we only have three research slots, but whatever. Special forces? No, we don't have special forces here. Ah, engineers, yes. Good. We love the engineers. One and a half billion in deficit. Not bad. Not bad. Oh, wow. This is a... Uh, Enoch Powell, Jellico. Wow, this is a really... This is definitely a coalition here. And definitely a coalition. But after followed up with a Demo democratic England, never before in her history has England been so democratic, with the voting franchise extended to all those from all walks of life, of all colors and creeds. It is through our continuing reforms that we have transformed our damp little island into a nation, a beacon of freedom and opportunity. We have done this after civil war, after invasion, after totalitarian power crushed our spirit. England is free in more ways than one. More conservative democracy, increase the strength of the Democrats? Sure, why not? Um, it's always the one, send a trip to America, and there you go. Perfect. As all things should be balanced. They're stuck with us now. Very good. Support weapons. Awesome. Uh, artillery. How's that looking? It is 68, so... Better artillery. We'll blow up the uh, Scottish over there. You're all maxed out, which is nice. Our fuel's looking actually very, very good. 1.37 billion in annual deficits. Not bad. We have actually more than enough anti-tank. Artillery's looking good. Anti-air is looking pretty bad, but the dinner party. I couldn't even have believed it, exclaimed Powell. I look at my file, and there's only three or four pages on me. And at the end, the knob who wrote it put unimportant, just unimportant. Can you believe that? Steve has looked as he took a bite of his meal, meat pie. I haven't looked at my file, but somebody told me it wasn't much either. It's absurd, declared Powell. I went to Africa, India, England, and military intelligence back in the World War, and I never saw combat. I have signed up for the rebellion to take part in the civil war and never see combat either. And now I hear that even if we lost, the bloody collabs wouldn't have even shot me. From what I hear, Wingate was awfully tempted to do just that back in India, remarked Aachen like prompting Sterling to snort. Everybody at the dinner party was happy and so was Jellico. It seemed like all his work had paid off. The NDO was now united and everyone was getting along just fine. All is well for now. The new armed forces, after a long fight, the people of England are finally free. Thanks to the efforts of thousands of brave Englishmen, lords of the Queen and country. 
when we prevailed over our misguided kin and restored democracy and legitimate monarch upon our blessed throne. Now, however, new challenges arise and we'll need a powerful reform military to face this brave new role with any hope of remaining afloat. Decades of stagnation and economic downfall have left our armed forces underfunded, undertrained, and underequipped. While our loyal militias have proven their bravery time and time again, we'll need a professional military. The Ministry of Defense shall undertake decisive reforms to ensure all the branches of the Royal Armed Forces are returned to their former glory. Um, actually, we... What happens if I cut this down? Oh, we could try it. We can only get... We still get 1.24 every single day. We actually get... Oh, that's not bad. That's not bad. Alright, and after this, I guess we'll do the Royal Army. The Royal Army once counted millions under its service, its forces hailing from all parts of our far-reaching empire, from the Scottish Black Guard to the Indian Sepoys. Today, nothing remains but fading memories. Despite the bravery of our troops during the Civil War, we can't deny that most of our current forces are made up of untrained militias. If we're to defend ourselves in a newfound freedom from those who would seek to steal it once again, we need to reform our armed forces and decide on a new course of our doctrine. A debate has already started in the General Staff. We can only wait and see how it develops. An English person's duty. Um, I think I've read this one before. So, if you want to read about this, please go right ahead. We're going to vote SLP and win the peace. Alright, now let's see. This is still pretty balanced. I don't want to touch this until, like, th this stuff is over, so. It's looking not too bad. Cornwall's looking pretty good. Southern Wales is looking pretty darn bad for us. Uh, 33 seeds, so that's not too bad. That's pretty good. That's not great. Um, it's, it's always really, I would recommend, look at the the percentages first before we even do anything here. See if there's anything close. Like like Lancashire. They're very close. It's pretty close. 5% difference. Uh, that's not very close at all. That's not super close. That's actually really bad for us. Well, Shire, but... Shire, but Shire, I think. But Oh, we're actually really close here. 25 seats. That's not bad. I'll probably do this one first. And Northern Wales is pretty good, too. So, it's always good to keep in mind what's going on. And this happens every five days, so we keep an eye on it. Yorkshire. 74 seats. That's pretty good. That's 11% away, though. That's 15% away. That is 1%. Huh. All right. We can probably do... Yep, Somerset's nice. Cool. Anywhere else, that's 13%, 15%, 11%. That's 74 seats. 55. 74 seats is a lot. 11, 74. We're going to go 74. Yorkshire is where we're going to hit it. Nice. SOP's campaigning at 7. Assessing the damage. Enoch Powell looks at the scene unfolding in front of him and sighs. It's the first stopover in this tour of the most important military installations around England. And the situation is already painfully evident. The Royal Artillery Barracks at Woolwich, just a few miles from London, are home to one of the most prestigious corps of the Ar Royal Army. But it seems that two decades of neglect in a civil war can break even the toughest spirits and the proudest military traditions. The... Elegant neoclassical facade is still filled with bullet holes from when several collaborator loyals had barricaded themselves inside, forcing the partisans to dig a hole into the ground and collapse part of the western wall to break in. The debris still clogs the roads. Inside, the signs of fighting that took place are even more visible with broken doors and windows, grenade impacts, and even a few bloodstains here and there. The royal artillery themselves must examine the state of their barracks. Most men have tired expressions, and there are holes in their lines. Their guns are old and rusty, mostly German leftovers. He swears he can recognize a couple BL 7.2 inches from the last war. Uh, the Union Jack hastily scratched out in favor of the St. George's Cross. The mere fact that these howitzers still worked in the Civil War was practically sorcery. Powell listened dutifully to the officer listing all the shortages of men and material, all the inefficiencies, old and new, all the problems of proposed solutions. He nodded at the appropriate times and promised help from the government for such fine young men, even though mo almost half of these in uniform had hair as white as untouched snow. But a corner of this mind was still asking a single question over and over, what do I do if everyone is like this? Uh, right, and we're probably going to keep gunning this way. Alright, nice. 13% um, is still pretty big, but that's a lot. That's go big or go home, right? Somerset is kind of dangerously ready to flip. So let's go and read after the Royal Army. The Royal Navy. For more than three centuries, the Royal Navy had been our greatest military asset and the main instrument for British supremacy over a quarter of the world. Hundreds of ships of the most modern designs used to sail across seas and oceans, protecting our colonies and reminding us all of our majesty. Even more importantly, our fleet protected the home isles themselves from any would-be invaders. When London fell to the Germans, dozens of ships were sunk by enemy bombers or in desperate action, and many others were seized by either the victorious foe or our own dominions when they declared their independence. What we have now is nothing but a mockery of our old glory left to rot by corruption and inefficiency. The time has come for a comprehensive reform we shall rebuild the Royal Navy, larger and more powerful than before. We shall rule the ways once again. So that's a difference of six, not bad. This is still kind of bad, but whatever. Honestly, we lose this. 25 seats for 74. Yeah. Oh. Oh, so cabinet is seven, huh? West Midlands. 
Um, that's not great, but we'll see what happens. 29%. What's it gonna go up to? So 29%, okay. The Royal Army, very good. And the Royal Navy. And let's go and read about hunting with Cloud. Despite his retirement, Cloud Auchinleck is still an influential figure in English politics, and his wisdom is appreciated even by his rivals. Our Prime Minister is especially fond of his mentor, and the two have forged a friendship throughout the years of underground resistance and civil war. Hoping to relax for a bit from the hardships of his official duties, George shall go on a hunting trip with Cloud, where they'll be able to get let go of their strict discipline and official roles for a couple days. Who knows, perhaps old Juno will let a couple of pearls of wisdom slip from his nut. I think we'll do this one too once we're done here. Needs more yellow. And elections in two months. And will it flip yet? No, we will not. It was very close. That was very, very close. Uh, it's still okay. It's still okay. Good. Base bleed. Very nice. It's a little bit of two out of time for us. Um, planes, yes. External fuel tanks. That's fine. Cut down on the debt for now. See what we can do about that. All right. And. Nice. We'll do it one more time, just to make sure it stays with us, so we'll see what happens. The Royal Navy, three days, not bad, not bad. Ah, that looks, that looks really good, look at that. A choice of method. With the restoration of the legitimate monarch, the armed forces have returned to the forefront of political discussion. The Royal Navy is, of course, the main objective, or main object of the government until meetings. All members agree that funding must be drastically increased to, main, to the main instrument of with which England arose to empire. How to use such funds is another matter entirely. The 18th meeting on the matter is to be held in the restored house of the Admiralty. The building shines just like the old days and would be so easy to forget that everything must be rebuilt from scratch. Despite the participation of the Prime Minister himself, the meeting soon degenerates into a battle between two sides. On one side are the young officers, mostly returned exiles from Canada who have studied with Americans. They strongly advocate for a modern fleet based on carriers rather than battleships. While some proposal, this would mean abandoning the image of the Royal Navy as it has been for centuries, and some would see it as a sign of subservience to the Americans. The other faction, counting among popular them several old admirals who have just been reinstated, proposes a completely different doctrine. The Royal Navy, they say, is more than just a fleet. It is a symbol of the British greatness, one that is far from the past and that must return. Also, they claim that people will surely appreciate a show of strength. The meeting is dismissed without any serious progress being made. But Jellicoe knows there's no time to be lost. The Royal Navy will return to the forefront one way or another, and the responsibility for its form rests on the shoulders. Who better than an admiral's son for rebuilding the Navy? will rule the waves once more. And then, issue conscription, uh, I mean with Sterling. Among the many officers of the Reform General Staff, David Sterling, remembered as a founder of the short-lived Special Air Service, has rather peculiar views on the future of the Royal Army. He spent years reflecting on a defeat in the war, and has had as and he has come to a rather surprising conclusion. Our army failed to defeat the Germans not because it wasn't big enough, but because it was too large. Poor coordination, lack of training, and subpar logistics were the result of an excessive reliance on conscription, and weighed heavily on our performance in the conflict. To address this issue, he proposes radical reforms. The new Royal Army should, according to Sterling, focus on small, highly trained strike teams, each unit an expert in a single aspect of warfare. He claims with special support and state-of-the-art equipment, these units can inflict much more damage to the enemy than average soldiers at a fraction of the cost. While such ideas seem to clash with the majority of the general staff, it would be wise to meet with Sterling anyways here do this because you can and nice so that's good uh severance uh, lost cause that's a lost cause uh oh we only 40 days left i don't we can get oxford here but we can try it why not we try it try it, try it, try it try as we might and now the slp is campaigning in northern wales oh Oh boy, 33% or 20%-ish, maybe. 20% jumps up to what, 21? That's fine. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Meeting the cloud. Or cloud. Cloud, cloud, whatever. The final act. Oh boy. Actually, how, how close are we getting? Oh, that's good, that's good. We have enjoyed friendly relations with the Scottish in our past. They were the ones who sent us firearms when no one else would, who gave us refuge when there was none, and ate our refugees when they had nowhere else to go, so we could just leave them alone as a favor. But there are many other reasons to push for a union, so we may call ourselves the UK again, certainly. However, there are more practical ones and simply a ego boost. Many of Scotland want a union back, and a union will provide Scotland with a high degree of security, something Scotland wishes for desperately. And there are the simple economic benefits to a free and unrestricted trade between us. We will give Scotland's or the Scots a fair offer, every freedom, every benefit, every advantage they have, they can keep. 
We will not seek to enforce a hierarchy like we have done in the past. Our democratic system is open to all, and the Scottish can see they would not suffer any under any hardships if they wish to join us with with us. Though they don't see reason, we will not hesitate to bring them to our senses, to their senses. A union once again, hopefully, and hunting with a friend. The forest surrounding beckles with silence, the evening sun giving an air of quiet laziness. Suddenly a whistle broke the common. Hundreds of barking noises filled the air. A single fox ran, followed closely by more than a dozen lavriers. Just a bit behind, the two men rode their horses, George Jellicoe and Cloud Auchinleck, out for a hunt. The fox desperately tried to lose his pursuers, but the dogs pressed and pressed until it simply fell to the ground exhausted. The younger of the two men took out his hunting rifle, aimed, and shot the defeated beast. Excellent aim as usual, George, said the old hunter. The two dismounted to assess their prey, the dogs barking to get their reward for a good hunt. Thanks, Claude. Suffolk never disappoints, Jellicoe replied. You didn't invite me just for a hunt, did you, Claude? Uh, Jellico asked his mentor and friend. No, George, I didn't. I wanted to talk to you about a very important matter, answered Cloud. The two men sat under large oak, then to the old general spoke. I know you're going to rebuild the royal army, and I want to give you my advice. I've fought for years against the Germans, and have spent many more reflecting upon the causes for our debacle. The prime minister nodded, and then let his friend continue. We were unprepared. We relied too much on the royal navy to keep them on the other side of the channel. And when they came, we could do nothing but, do nothing but retreat. We retreated north because we had no prepared line. Some even suggested building AA on Hadrian's Wall. Those fools. I can like look pained, old memories flooding his mind, but he pressed on. I know that the choice is yours, but let me tell you this. The Germans are so on just as bad while we're returning, we must be ready. England needs a strong army. One big enough to defend our coast should the fleet fail us again. George Jellicoe looked at his friend, the determination, the pain, the fear in his eyes. Even though he lo still, ha still hadn't chosen, he knew he would not forget such words. An old friend's advice is always precious and light in the north. We have successfully consolidated our power in England, and it's time to move on to greener pastures. One of the hurdles we must jump before unifying Britain and Scotland, unlike our forefathers 300 years ago. This Scotland has prepared for the invasion since its inception. Since the end of the last Great War, a rivalry has developed between us. Now that collaborators and their allies have been disposed of, we can talk of unification once again. And just in case, I will say, just in case, just you know, you never know. Cool, and let us continue. And what are the Scots will say? What will they say? Especially with the elections raging on right now. Come on, drop down further, please. We're seven percent difference. We probably won't be able to get them, but that's fine. Whatever. Um, good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Not bad. And one more day. Didn't really help us out that much, but whatever. Nothing here we can cut down just yet, and we're going to stop cutting down for a while, just because, well, stuff isn't going to happen. A group of diplomats walk into the plane on Heathrow. It leaves the ground early in the morning, and in an hour or so it'll be in Edinburgh. When it stands and lands, the negotiations will begin. Negotiations that will determine the fate of the British Isle and the people on it. Negotiations that, if successful, will unify Scotland with England once again. Negotiations that may uh, finally allow us to take the mantle of the UK of old. These will be hard. The Scottish will certainly drive the hardest bargain they can, but they will not surrender their freedoms for nothing in return. And failure on our part will certainly lead to another massive war on the island, one which will exact a large cost and lives on both sides. Let's get them talking. I'm giving them nothing. I want war. I want absolute war. The talks begin. Um, if you want to read about that, please go right ahead. Yeah, let's do this. That looks like exactly the same as I've read before, so. Oh, now we get that after our, the autosave, of course. Oh, we were so close. 28%, 3% difference. Ah, uh, our opening offer. You have to start with something. Cool. Ah, we're gonna get them. The decision of a free people. Months of advertisements, speeches and rallies, debates, arguments and insults, shouting and heated discussion, and now it all comes down to this, the choice of the people of England. Both parties have been battling hard to ensure their victory in the polls. Could they have done more? Could have some missteps have been avoided? Could this campaign have been conducted more positively? Perhaps, but both campaigns have done whatever they could to ensure victory in the coming elections. Nothing less than the very future of the country is at stake. After the ballots are cast, the people of England scurry home to turn on the TVs and radios to see who the winner is. Many predictions have biases and hopes. Others have polls and samples behind their thinking, but there's only one way to know for sure what has happened, and that is the count the votes. The NDL wins the elections again. Nice. All right, Scotland, what you gonna do? The Jellicoe's Triumph. The second election and the New England has always going to be about one thing only, the current government. Unlike the past one where the population would decide under New England, this one was about if this England was the only one they really wanted. They decided to give the Jellicoe government another term or try something new, and the people chose the NDL. A center-right coalition was preferable to many of the voters instead of a socialist party as SPL. Promising free markets and limited social reform, as well as a return to respectability on the world stage, the NDL was warmly received by many voters skeptical of the need for radical socialist reforms, and still being the party of Claude Auchinleck helped convince many people to give them their ballot. 
In a victory speech, Prime Minister Jell George Jellico promised to follow through on their promises and policy proposal. Many are optimistic that he'll be able to get the job done, but some point out that he has still has a combustible mix of party members in his government, and he should take care to ensure they don't blow up the entire organization. The PM will need all of our strength to pull through. Great, the tide stay dormant for now. Um, with that, let's cut it down, because we really have no more cities to spend. Really? Oh, okay. We these two. But even with that, we're still building stuff up. We have a thousand PP, so I'm feeling pretty good about that. The counter offer. Um, read about that. That's fine. A better deal? Ooh, you know, I'll say this one. Because this, this one determines everything here. But if you want to read about the counter offer, please go ahead. Um, that's fine. How about a Scotch Council instead? Limited autonomy. Please say no. I don't want to get hit really hard. Because we'll get like point like five, maybe point six or seven in terms of PP if they get the Scottish Council. Please say no. Please say no. Please say no. Come on. Please say no. One last try. Okay. We want our full Scottish Council, full stop. Either we receive the Council or Scotland does not join the Union. Simple as that. If we join the Union, we only want a Council for us to self-govern, said the Scottish negotiator to an English negotiator, who had sat across from him at the table. The English negotiator seemed even more annoyed and replied, more annoyed than anything at the fact that he now had to deal with the idea of a Scottish Council running around. If they had let the Scottish join and send down, it could be a massive blow for the country. Letting a country in with such a high autonomy, this could be a disaster for the public. However, the idea of a Scottish Council could lessen tensions between our two nations. He then replied to the Scot, hoping he could persuade the man we accept your proposal. Nope. Don't trifle with us. We're ready to go in. Guns blazing. We have no tanks too, so. Uh, go combine arms, because we don't have any tanks. I don't think these guys have tanks, do they? Ten combo with? Ten combo with? No. Oh, they do have IVs. I forgot about that, but whatever. <clears throat> Come on, Scotland, say no. I know they've got a lot of IVs, and they're very strong in defense, because they need to be. But, come on, let's go, 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 come on. Come on. Talk is cheap. Ah, look at that. Scotland refused to discuss any more terms. There were attempts to get them to a degree. There were attempts to get them at least discussing the terms again. There were attempts to get everyone to at least say, stay in the room. They all failed, and everyone knew what must come next. <clears throat> Panic spread across the island. Civilians prepared to flee the border regions. The soldiers mobilized and prepared to fight in Edinburgh and England. Politicians and generals both looked at the same map with foreboding and dread. Another war in Britain had begun, and for the first time in the modern era, it would be between Scotland and England. And we all suffer for it. Let's go! Send the infantry in. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's go, 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 go. Let's keep those Scots a thing. The Scottish cannot see reason. Unfortunate. And now we shall show them reason. The door slammed shut. If you want to read about a door wide open, please go ahead, but a door slammed shut. It seems the Scots didn't take too kindly to the idea of reunification. Our diplomatic team was turned away in Edinburgh after making the intentions clear. While that seems like an opportunity taken from us, it is still possible to return Scotland to the fold. We have no choice now but to invade, and while we may be in the history books as conquerors, we have done this for our children and their children so that they will see a united Britain. I'm really not worried about this. Keep going. The Union Jack Files. After our efforts, the Union Jack flies once again over Scotland. It's taking time, but now one of the most beautiful places on the British Isles is under our control. Their people are also under our control, and some have been more unruly than expected. However, we've placed small contingents on soldiers in Scottish cities and towns to ensure peace. Talks have begun about a Scottish Parliament, and that will both serve in the House of the Lords, in conjunction with their own Parliament based in Holyrood. This is the first step to make sure that they are seen as equal. Now the English flag flies next to the Scottish flag, united. Keep going, guys. Scotland, why? Why did you do this? Dune's grandparents, why? And the gun. Whoa, would you look at that flag? Beautiful. God, I wish we could invade Ireland. But that would cause World War Three, probably, so. Cool. And just gonna do this, that's fine. And do London, because you don't want to forget about London. Um, good job, guys. Come on down here, too. And the Union Check Files. And what do we have here? Eh, that's not bad, not great, though. The bagpipes sing no more. The Scottish nationalism is an issue we've been facing ever since we had brought Scotland back into the fold. Terrorist attacks have begun on our soldiers, with some of the old guard comparing it to the North Irish War nearly 40 years ago. While most of the Scottish people have been cooperative towards this, it appears that we may need to be much more heavy-handed to change in the air. 
Um, things are becoming slowly better in Scotland. The air is less foggy and the skies are a little brighter. And the people aren't as angry as they used to be. It seems that the hatred and anger towards the English in Scotland has gotten better. Resentment will always be there, it seems, but right now isn't manifesting itself to be, as it used to. Our government is slowly getting a grip on the situation, and hopefully soon it'll only become a dark memory. May there be peace in, in the North. Actually, let's do this. Let's pause this real quick. Uh, Union once again. What do you want to be a sailor for? There are greater storms in politics than you will ever find at sea. Piracy, broadsides, and blood on the decks. You'll find them all in politics. Rural Britannia. <clears throat> Alright. I wonder if I can get copyright claim there. I might be, I actually might get copyright claim. But a change in the air, good. Uh, after our many trials, we've united and unified the British Isles. Our power is now consolidated, and we are once again the rulers of Scotland and Wales. Finally, we can reclaim the mantle of our Great Britain. Lost for 20 years, now we can begin to unite our people together and make our country a great power again. We are a part of the free world, and we will remain so for the next 100 years. Rule Britannia. F f r ah. Part of the free world forever, my friends. Don't just, don't ask about the Scottish and their freedom. Just don't ask. Cool. Nice, nice, nice. After that, oh, oh, we get some recon companies. Awesome, 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 awesome. Jolly good, as some might say. So after that, we can finally go ahead and do this. Democracy stands. The NDL has won a second victory of the polls and returns to Parliament with a solid majority. The people of England have spoken. They align with their politics and support our agendas as enthusiastically as they had before. It's clear that our first success can be explained not just by our being an alternative to the socialism or being the closest reminder to the politics of old, but also because the people believe in our political agenda. With this mandate, we can make confident strides in our reforms. The NDL will build a better, brighter future for England. Oh, yes, please. Followed up with... Barry Goldwater inaugurated a strong military. American military is good for us all. I kind of got to play as him again. Or play as him. I didn't, at the time of this recording, I've not played as him yet, and I want to play as him really badly. May the light burn ever so bright. Since the NDL is triumphant once more, the leaders of each of its parties will be summoned to discuss the future of the government. Even though the party has achieved another electoral victory, divisions still exist within the League, once again. These divisions will need to be resolved if we're to be governing effectively. We've already promised that people are brighter future, but there's a long way to go before we can actually get there, and we've got to figure out... How many acts we can do because we want to make sure that we can do them all appropriately and quickly. A new social plan sounds like one we have to do. Nation, English society. Ooh. Not bad. The cost of education. Yeah, this is going to be probably very costly for us. <clears throat> the NHS, huh? Ah, oh, the dem is done. Good job, guys. Good good job. Special forces. Oh, special, special forces. Oh, 28 day focus. I didn't even realize it was 28 day. Oh, these are all 28 day. Jesus Christ, that's, that's so long. I'm used to the 21 day focus. A glowing endorsement. The returns could not have been better. As soon as they were announced over the TV, everyone at NDL headquarters uh, and cheered. Prime Minister Jellicoe, when his seat was up, could not be have happen, been happier. The NDL had won and he had, made, had a mandate. Now, the next day, it was back to work, making moves behind the scenes, congratulating all the NDL members who wanted to maintain their seats, thinking of those who had lost, and trying to find a way to work around those their absence and in this new parliament. When Parliament opened, Jellicoe was going to press for his policies to the hilt. The people had spoken, they had endorsed his plans, and these reforms would find a way through the Parliament. Now that they're, now that that's out of the bloody way, let's get on with it. There's the work to be done. We have spent enough time on making victory speeches promising a new and prosperous uh, age for England. Now we should get down to specifics. There's much work to be done and many pro compromises to be made, but the NDL will do what it can to better the lives of all the people it governs. Jellicoe jumped off the ski lift at the top of the hill and looked, took in the view from Anok Moor. He had done this several times since he got there, but it was still magnificent. Miles of open snow, vast mountains of prime skiing routes, and the best part he thought as he prepared to go down the path it was now all British. Good God, he had thought as he accelerated down the mountain, he missed the skiing opportunities were few and far between after the war. The Alps were either fascists or cut off by them. There were a few hills in the U.S. that diplomats liked him went on to talk about with American politicians, but there just wasn't a good hill for the people in England to enjoy like this. And now there was, with Scotland firmly united with England once more. Whatever the cost of the Union, they were worth it, he thought, as he reached the bottom. The boys of the ski club loved it, too. They were the ones of the first of his friends he called, promising a grand get-together at the resort in the Highlands. And they came, even some of the newer members from the reintegrated Scottish chapter. After so long, they were extremely happy to have mountains that could be accessible to every Englishman and woman. And Jellico was happy that one of his favorite spots, sports was now readily available. And the tabloids can catch him doing this as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Three weeks left, which is totally fine. So we're making one, two, three, four, five, six civvies, which is great. And we're going to keep getting down the depth. 
We're going to continue cutting down civilian spending because even... You know what? I'm glad. I'm glad that we didn't get the Scottish Council. Sorry, Dune's grandparents, but whatever. It is what it is. And if you're Scottish watching this, it is what it is. It just is what it is. 1313, as the Democrats get more power. Nice. Hey, cut it down, baby. Minus 700 billion. Million. I wish it was billion. Wow, it'd be a lot. We ain't, we ain't America here. Oh, cut. Oh, we cut that even more, and it's still the same. Oh, well, it's military spending that we need to talk about, too, really. Um, we need to cut down. Oh, uh, after the victory lap. All right, Minister Sajilico, we have secured a mid major victory with our re-election. We still have a majority in Parliament to continue making our changes and reforms, and the people of England have given us a broad endorsement of our policy proposals and platforms. So, what do we want to focus on first? I think social reforms should be our first priority, said John, St. John Stevens. The past few years have seen a substantial changing of attitudes, especially in regards to the roles of women and the perception of homosexuality. There has been substantial changes in the public att attitudes that must be addressed, said Powell, and they need to be corrected. However, we must also keep in mind the terrible state of the economy right now, as well as the tendency for the working classes to be overwhelmingly labor. Agreed, said Jellico. We need to have greater protections for the poor of the country, or we risk having them be a labor block forever. Our welfare system needs to be reformed as well, and the healthcare system. System. We should all consider getting rid of the unnecessary taxes and closing loopholes instead. Now, when we go to the floor, a plan begins to form. Of course. Alright, so, uh, a new social plan, the English Society, the Family, Tradition and Modernity, Children and Wives Act, the Sexual Offenses. Ooh, forgive me, Mr. Sebas. Huh. The Nation, uh, Refugees and Jobs, obviously we'll do a lot of these later on. They stand for Freedom and Dignity. Ooh, ooh. You get more monthly population board. Act. Well, it's all a balancing act, so. I kind of do the work of protection. It's kind of like that. But we might be able to fix that later. The cracks in the system, the radicals, far left. I kind of do all this stuff, but I do want to do the economy, though. The English society, fixing the tax system. Ooh! Ooh, that's really good. Fixing, yeah, we lose political power, we get more GDP growth by 2%. Calling the English tax system broken would be an understatement of magnificent proportions. The amount of unnecessary and unhelpful taxes levied upon the people is astounding, and has hamstrung the economy at a time when it needed as much as it could get, or as much help. We should reform the system so that we can properly strengthen and reinforce our economy. Absolutely. Now it's minus 1.26 billion. Great. Cut that baby down. Well, generally, you don't want to be cutting babies, but let's not talk about that. Um, mm, let's see. Yeah, let's do that again. There you go. Ha, <laughs> cut them both down. Ha, ha, ha. There is always work to be done, but yeah, that's not too bad, actually. This is going a, a little better than I think when I played Harold Wilson. Of course, we haven't done the reforms yet. With the reforms with Harold Wilson, we cut down things quite a bit, but we had a lot more spending because of... The societal improvements we wanted to make, of course. Awesome, awesome, awesome. But yeah, the economy. PP goes bye-bye. That's fine with us. What is this one? Cutting useless... Why does it keep going back to the top? Please stop going back to the top. Cutting useless taxes. Ooh, we get more money. We lose political power. Oh, let's get some more money first. It hurts our PP. That's only 0 0.1. And we currently get, even with cutting civilian spending, 1.24. So, too much of our inherited taxation system does more harm than good. We even have taxes that cost us more to keep track of than their worth in revenue. We shall ease the people's tax burden by removing some of these taxes, but not so many that we effectively new to the government. In doing so, we shall not only increase our consumer spending, but also increase support from the people. We lose a little bit of stability, but we would have so much. Our worst words are actually really, really bad if you look at it right now. 16% because we have Welsh riots, Scottish terrorists, <laughs> that sounds really bad. Civilian austerity, of course, military assistance, no supervision, and pretty bad poverty, but hey, it is what it is. But the GDP, but the GDP, everyone. After this, we're going to start focusing on more acts because we it's, a, it's, a, it's just a massive balancing act. What about the rich? Uh, oh, we lose even more political power and less stability for more money. Oh, that's so good to do, though. We'll do that one. Uh, I want to do that one next, but because there's no real act we can do immediately at next. Uh, the fight for healthcare, because this is all going to hurt us. Oh, crap. Uh, I'll do this one first. Work more. Calling the English tax system broken would be an understatement of magnificent proportions. The amount of unnecessary and unhelpful taxes levied upon the people is astounding and can only have helped to hamstring the economy in a time when it is needed as much as it can get. We must reform the system so that we can properly strengthen and reinforce the economy. Why is that the exact same thing? Yeah, exactly the same. This is different, but this third one is different. The same. Huh. Hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> Very good. Help out just a little bit. Hey! The growth is now 3.2%. Very nice. Very, very nice. More jobs, please. More jobs. And then we'll start doing a lot of acts. And then we will no longer have a deficit. <laughs> Alright, work more. Just work more. Netsram. Oh, Netsram. Very cool. 
<clears throat> my apologies for me coughing at my, my voice just like apparently there's too much phlegm in my voice but uh new social plan on refugees and jobs i'll do new social plan maybe yeah let's do that one we are not the royal party. Spineless, elitist, bending to the rich. Neither are we the socialist labor party, forcing our reforms upon the people. We are the NDL fair and just. We shall open the way to reform our reforms to build a better England. Our new social plan will help to better all of England. The door is open to all, and it is up to them to step through it. Because we do on the Business Support Act, we want to do the Education Cost Act, the NHS. Better pay for doctors. Everything here we gotta do. We gotta do everything here. I'm probably gonna say this for the last. Maybe we'll see. <clears throat> but you, you never know. Uh, quarter million reserves, that's not bad. A new social plan followed up with deals in business. The co op economy of small businesses. By supporting these small businesses through subsidies and grants, we can encourage the people to open up new enterprises. This will help increase employment and greatly expand the economy as a whole. Nice. 80 billion. 60 billion. Basically, 61 billion. That's alright. Minus 1.42 billion. Not bad, my friends. Keep making this better. Actually, you know what? Let's not do that ahead of time. If we're going to do anything ahead of time, it's going to be um, research speed. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Actually, military spending is the lowest thing we have right now. So the only construction spending is fairly slightly higher than military spending, but it's really just civilian spending that's super high. A change in the air. Oh, great. May there be peace in the north. If you want to bet that, please go ahead. More wall support. Great. Nice. It's all the balancing act, my friends. All the balancing act. Because right now we're going to beeline for the act. We're going to be, 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 be line for that baby. Because I want to get, yeah, business support. Deals and businesses, please. Deals, deals, deals. And I like a good seal. The welfare plan. Mr. Speaker, members of parliament, Sir Big Angelico, I am delighted to reveal the new welfare proposed by the NDL. I'm sure this house would agree that there are many Englanders who are suffering at this very moment. Decades of exploitation, economic mismanagement, and catastrophe have pushed so many to the absolute limits. Many have hardly enough to get by. Some cannot get by at all, and we must not stand idly waiting or idly by without providing a safety net for the most unfortunate of our citizens. The welfare proposal will change that. It will provide welfare to the needy, ensuring those that cannot work need not worry about their dwindling savings. Or, <clears throat> the everyday needs. It guarantees uh, that each English person has access to health care without it being a necessarily or needlessly expensive burden upon them. And it grants the children of England an education necessary to develop the skills needed in the modern world. To compete in fields dominated by spacecraft and computers. My honorable friends, we must pass this proposal and do so without delay or hesitation. Our people demand relief and we must provide it. Our prosperity can be had if we work for it. Look at the PP. Stability. Great. All right, and we shall do economy from a young age. We cannot expect to ensure continued economic growth and the nation without a more economically minded population. To this end, we shall introduce more businesses and economic classes in schools to raise the next generation to be more knowledgeable with regards to the economy. And it's not a massive GDP growth, but we're going to need it when the oil crisis hits. And research facilities improve? Great, great, great. That's what we like to see. Actually, that's not the size of what it used to be, huh? Three days left? Great. More jobs. More jobs. And then we'll conclude with a business support act. We shall attempt to pass a bill through Parliament for the benefit of England. The Business Support Act will allow us to give further aid and support to small businesses to reinforce the economy. It shall also sh allow us to send funds towards individuals who are attempting to start up businesses, encouraging entrepreneurial behavior and benefiting the economy. Great. And let's go just do and cut, cut. Thank you. 1.45 billion is not bad. And you know what? We'll end this episode reading one more thing because I'll probably do a lot of this off screen for this one. Fight for healthcare. Uh, the cost of education, yes. If we're to provide an affordable education to all members of society, we must first reduce the cost of education wherever we can. We shall start with the most wasteful aspects of education, such as unnecessary and outdated textbooks and other equipment. With any luck, though, alongside education grants and subsidies, we shall reduce the cost of schooling to much more affordable levels. Wait. Unnecessary and outdated textbooks. Well, if they're outdated, you just need to replace them. That doesn't mean you cut costs. But anyways, hey, if you enjoyed this video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when we will reform more of the UK and see what will happen with the oil crisis where it'll make your economy explode poorly. Thanks for watching, though, and have a great rest of your day.